All right, thanks Robin. And uh, thank you all for being here. Our hope is that this next hour or so will be full of takeaway tips that you can implement right away uh, at your nonprofit's next marketing or fundraising effort. So uh, let's dive in. Our first mistake uh, is skimping on audience segmentation efforts. And we're starting with this mistake because this is one that we see happening first in the process of developing marketing and fundraising materials. So this mistake is made before any words are written, any images are chosen, any media tactics are uh, lined up. And that mistake is neglecting the step of truly understanding your audience, or more likely for, for most of you, it's multiple audiences. Uh, understanding how they differ so that you can segment your communication, your visuals, and your donation requests appropriately. So often at the outset of working with clients, we'll ask them, who are your donors? And they'll usually give us their, their house list or an exported file out of their database, and we'll get some, some names and some addresses and some giving history. And if we're lucky, we'll get some cell phone numbers and email addresses too. And we always say like, thanks, this is good, uh, but who are your donors really? What makes them tick? What are their preferences? What do their households look like? Uh, what media do they consume? And often when we start digging in with more questions like that, uh, many of them honestly don't know how to answer that. And there's all kinds of ways to find out more about your donor audience along these lines. Uh, Mosaic Profiles, which is uh, put out by a company called Experian, uh, they're ones that we uh, often use to, to find these answers, and they segment your physical address list into different codes. And if you're not familiar with them, I just want to give a quick example of one of the codes reports, just so you can see the kind of information you get here. So uh, you see a breakdown of this group's key features, the age of their household head, their children, how they consume media, how tech savvy they are. And then you also get a narrative for each uh, code that breaks down things like political, religious beliefs, their likely hobbies, how they spend their extra money. And reports like this can turn into a goldmine for the creative process. As you can imagine, you know, picture how much stronger, say, your copywriter or your designer of the next direct mail piece or your next ad campaign uh, would be if they first read through not just that person's or that group's giving history, uh, but also uh, this mosaic profile information. So they know exactly who they're writing and designing for. So once you have that data and analysis, both the giving history and something like a mosaic profile. Uh, then we move into uh, audience segmentation through creative. So that's your image choice, your messaging choice, and all with that focus on identifying your ideal donor, or maybe it's your ideal volunteer, depending on what kind of campaign we're doing, and tailoring that marketing message right to them. Too often we see Clients uh, want to have kind of a one size fits all or what we call like a spray and pray approach as they send out one direct mail piece or one ad uh, to everyone on their list. But it's important to remember that not everyone is interested in every aspect of what your nonprofit does. And uh, I see here we have a bunch of our family and children's and counseling services agencies uh, tuning in. So just to give an example from their world, you know, um, so as a woman in my late 30s, for instance, I might uh, relate more to donating to the single moms and the children that you help through your organization. I may not relate to donating to, say, the men with substance misuse issues. Uh, so it would be better if I received a mailer or an ad with messaging or visuals about, say, moms and, and families. And just to give you an example of that in action here, uh, these ads were made for the food bank of the Southern Tier, and we laser focused them um, on this certain category of people. In this case, it was moms who were likely to have children in this age range. I'll give you another example here. Um, whoop, went too far. Uh, this one is for LEFSA, uh, which stands for Life Experience and Faith Sharing Associates. They're out of New York City, and they serve the homeless. And this ad that we did for them segmented those who give to LEFSA for a faith-based reason. And you could see that there in the copy. And it varied 
from these ads uh, that uh, were targeted at those who may not have a faith affiliation, but but definitely want to make the world a better place for their fellow neighbors. You can see that uh, creative difference there. To give another example, you know, imagine tailoring your message to resonate specifically to environmental activists. Maybe you read that in the Mosaic profile. Uh, so this is an example of an earth themed mailing we did for our friends at Mary Knoll Sisters. So you can see the possibilities for customizing that engagement is it's really endless. So in addition to the data analysis uh, and then the creative that matches it, the third way to audience segment is through direct personalization message to resonate specifically your potential donors actual name on whatever you're sending them. But it's not just personalizing names on letterheads anymore. We used to be restricted to that, but not anymore. I mean, now there are so many options. Basically, any part or element of the uh, direct mail package can be variable. So you can also personalize uh, like the outer envelope image or like in the case of these uh, postcards, the image and the text. Uh, maybe you want to change the image that's there as people pop the letter out of the envelope. And we're also seeing a lot of personalized URLs or promo codes, and those are great for, you know, including the, your first name in the, in the URL you'd use. They're also really helpful for tracking, so another thing to be aware of. You can also customize gift arrays down to each unique donor, and that's based on their giving history, as you see in this example. And we did this for UHS Foundation this past year uh, for their annual appeal. It looked like this. And this particular mailing included a customized gift array on both the reply card and then in the letter, it also included their a customized last gift. Uh, and interesting too, on this example, uh, we sent to six different audiences ranging from top donors to individuals to businesses to lapsed donors in, in those different categories. So by the time everything was customized, potential donors received this package and it especially felt like it was just for them. And I think the results spoke to that. Now this next slide is for the maybe the financial directors who uh, have joined uh, this webinar perhaps and are thinking like holy smokes you want to you want to customize all this you want to add layers of different creatives like how much is this all going to cost and sometimes yes it does require uh, more of an investment but often our clients are shocked uh, to find out uh, that that these customizations are are actually more cost effective than they may realize and that's thanks to the advancements in digital printing that we've seen lately so digital printing eliminates the need for actual printing plates it allows for a technique called variable data printing or vdp and that works with front-end software that informs the digital press where customization should appear and that allows for hundreds, maybe even thousands of unique mail pieces to be printed at a time efficiently and relatively cost effectively. So, so to clarify here, as we're talking about marketing mistakes uh, to avoid, this, this mistake isn't just not customizing enough necessarily, but the mistake would be not at least considering how the investment in variation could be outweighed by an increase in donation amounts that will likely happen when people feel that the uh, experience you've given them is, is tailored to them. Oh, sorry, I have a little tech, tech issue there, a little hiccup. All right, here we go. Uh, also, don't forget to customize eblasts. Uh, getting uh, people's name right in the subject line is something uh, we're playing around with to see, does that help them uh, maybe not trash it as quickly? And we've also seen these uh, click and scratch reveal messages. I honestly don't know how to make these yes, yet, but I'm gonna find out uh, because I think it's very engaging. Uh, this birthday themed one was also customized with the person's first name. And, you know, even if you normally delete emails like this, I think you're probably going to engage with this one, whether it's on your phone doing this with your thumb or uh, with your mouse on the screen, uh, just because it's a new technology and fun to play with. So uh, another something to consider there. 
And then don't make the mistake of not segmenting and personalizing your acknowledgements. So sometimes we'll see our clients invest in a, a customized appeal or letter on the ask side, but then they send a generic acknowledgement letter, uh, which can be an opportunity missed. So that's audience uh, segmentation uh, in a nutshell and some mistakes to avoid there. And now my friend Lizzie is going to walk us through our next mistake, which is not telling your story. So Lizzie, go ahead and take take control there. Thanks, Jamie. And thank you everyone for being here today. I'm very happy to share our insights uh, and connect with you. Tailoring our outreach to your audience is excellent advice. Now we want to speak to a little more on the content of your outreach and how you can best implement your most powerful tool, which is storytelling. You want to make sure your marketing strategy includes telling your story so you can present yourself in a way that helps people connect with you, understand your values, and move them to action. In today's world, people are bombarded with information, as much as 34 gigabytes of data every day. That's the same as reading or hearing 100,000 words. It's a lot and it's very tiring. And our brains help us filter out a lot of that so that we can skim over things and not bother retaining what's perceived as unimportant by our subconscious. So storytelling is a way for you to stand out and signal to people's brains that your message, whether it's your video, your ad, your social media channel is worth tuning into. So let's talk about making your stories compelling and unique as I'm guessing that you have many great stories to tell. Nonprofits are doing amazing things that have impact in our communities. And you want to pull out those stories to share with your donors or volunteers or members so that you can engage and retain them. In choosing which examples to use in a storytelling piece, consider what would best highlight the things that differentiate you, either from other nonprofits competing for the same dollars or in a way that would move someone to give who's maybe never given before. For example, achieve provide services to individuals with intellectual, de developmental, and other disabilities in Broome, Shenango, and Tioga counties, and they have for more than seven decades. They offer day programs, housing, job support, fun activities that bring people together. They also provide respite for the caregiver. And that might not be different from what other similar organizations do, but it might be what really moves someone to give. Not everyone can identify with having a developmental disability, but a parent can definitely empathize with the increased need for care that comes with having a child with special needs, possibly moving them to give in support of this particular service. So focusing your story Think creatively about which stories would be most compelling for your organization. Next, you wanna use testimonials whenever you can. Don't always ask people to take your word for it. Storytelling is great when it's from the mouths of those who benefited from your services or those who feel proud about how their donations are put to work through you, or even those who are doing the work and seeing the rewards firsthand. When you take the time to compose a compelling story, you wanna prepare it to be formatted in multiple ways. Make it a social post, a press release, a blog, even consider making it into a video. In today's world, people wanna consume information through video. So choosing that format could be what makes your story compelling and unique. And let's talk about video a little bit more because it is really important. Unlike a tweet or a direct mail postcard, video gives you the space to tell a story with both sights and sounds that are gonna amplify your message. Visuals that reinforce the voiceover make a stronger impression on the viewer. And think about how music in a commercial can really make you pay more attention. I think we all know which commercial I'm talking about. <laughs> of course. <laughs> a great place for your story video is to live right on your homepage as a way to introduce people to what it is you do. And these, pay these types of videos can be one to three minutes long. It could also be formatted to be tall and skinny, and you could use it as a reel on Facebook and, or Instagram, or even run it on TikTok if you have a TikTok channel. And you can then create shorter versions to use in your paid campaigns, whether it's traditional campaigns on TV or digital campaigns where videos can appear in stories or as a pre-roll placement where we're showing it to a targeted audience. 
Where your storytelling video will appear will guide you on how it should be produced in terms of the length, the size or the shape. You may want to plan to have a, that long version for your website and socials and then make shorter cuts of it to use for advertising. And you want to think all of this through before producing the video because the variety of sizes and versions you will need are going to impact the cost of the project. Here's some common shapes and sizes for video to use both in digital and traditional marketing. All of them are used in social placements as well. So if you're doing an organic Facebook or Instagram video, you'll want the tall skinny one on the right. If you are doing a paid campaign um, on, on meta platforms, Facebook and Instagram, they're gonna ask you for all three of these sizes. Then the 16 to nine ratio shape that you see in the middle, that's what you would use for TV and most uh, pre-roll or in-story digital campaigns. And so just looking at these different shapes and sizes, you can imagine how it is more work on the creative side uh, to produce these videos and have these different formats. And that's why we're just recommending to you today, if you're thinking about storytelling this way, that you plan ahead. Finally, uh, when it comes to using video to tell your story, you want to consider the call to action and how someone might take action after being moved by your story. So if your video is on social media or part of a digital ad campaign, they should be able to just click on it um, and connect to your social channels very easily. However, if you are running on TV, whether that's on cable, broadcast, or even OTT, it's not that easy if it's up on your television. We can include phone numbers and website addresses on the screen like we probably traditionally do, but another thing to consider would be including a QR code. So someone can point their phone at the TV, scan the QR code, and instantly pull up a very specific landing page of your choice. So here we have on the screen um, an example of a Geico commercial with a QR code in it. Uh, so you can imagine how it would benefit this company to have people directed to the exact right place on their website to take action. It just gives you a little more control and hopefully improves response rate or for, for all of you, donations. So what, what, what are we stressing today when it comes to telling your stories is really be strategic with the story you choose to tell so it helps you stand out. Format your story to be told in multiple places, online and traditional media, written and visual. And if you're going with video, which is a very compelling format for storytelling, consider all the ways in which you could use the video so you can properly budget for the scope of that project. Get all the right sizes and cuts that you'll need. And taking the time to tell your story could transform your marketing strategy. It can energize your fundraising and really help with maintaining important connections. Back to you. Uh, next up, sorry. Uh, our next Still pitfall, you, my friend. <laughs> yes, staying with me. Um, our next pitfall to avoid is relying solely on traditional marketing. And this is a very easy trap to fall into because it's tradition. Uh, it's what we've been doing for years, and many times it's still productive for you. So that can make it really tempting to just stay in that comfort zone. But the longer you wait to diversify, to go digital, the more you could be missing out on. Even if you don't have the capacity to be an early adopter who's at the front of the line for every new digital trend, you certainly don't wanna be the last to the table. So having a strategy that combines successful traditions with wise new ventures will help you have a voice in more places, connect with your target audience in more ways, and use some more measurable tactics. When it comes to breaking out of traditional and into digital, there's a big landscape to navigate. So what makes sense for one organization might not work well for another. So let's talk about what you would want to accomplish with a good media mix to help you sort through the many options out there for marketing these days and, and the new ones that are coming out all the time. We could probably do a whole lunch and learn session on communicating across generations. So uh, we'll try to keep this brief, but it's an important thing to factor in for many reasons. Generations are not measured on a preset time frame. It's not like every 10 or 20 years. Generations are based on societal progress. So thanks to technology, they're accelerating. The time frame of each generation is getting smaller. So we currently have six generations of donors more than at any other point in American history. From the silent generation approaching their 80s down to our teenage gen alphas, it's a wide range. And they all have their own preferences on how they're consuming information. So successful businesses and organizations will need to appeal to many of them, which means you need to know where to find them and what they want to hear to be moved to action. 
When you have a presence on multiple media, it makes for a more engaging and positive user experience. Just consider how frustrating it can be when you can't easily find what you're looking for online. And we all kind of have a shorter fuse when it comes to technology. We want instant gratification, and we can also be really easily distracted online. So investing in a website that ranks well in search results or in marketing tools like paid search ads, that'll ensure you're easily found on Google and Bing. Think about the convenience of providing a QR code on your direct mail piece to link potential donors directly to the easy to use landing page that both affirms their decision to give and makes giving simple. Incorporating more touch points for new and returning donors can help with brand loyalty and overall retention. The regular and relevant email blasts, engaging social posts, whether organic or paid, targeted ads and mailers, they all work together to give frequency to your message, which drives impact. We should strive to be politely persistent by being in all the places our target audiences would be. We all have limited time and money though, and we can't commit to being everywhere all the time. So coming up in a few minutes, Jamie's gonna speak more to the importance of testing and using analytics to figure out what's working best for you. Finally, when we're talking about our media mix, I, I also wanna make sure that we talk about our messaging mix. Certain media are gonna be better poised for specific types of messages. Some give us the space to do all three of these, brand, story tell, have a call to action, where others are gonna limit us to just one or two types of messages. To give some examples, social media has the opportunity to do any of these through video, organic posts, paid campaigns, and more. A, a 30 second TV ad, is where you can tell a story and have a call to action or simply run an ad that furthers your brand. And then we have paid search ads, which are just call to action. So having that mix of media provides you with the opportunity to have a mix of messaging, which keeps your target audience engaged and provides more potential touch points that result in them taking action. Now you might be thinking, shouldn't everything have a call to action? Well, would you like talking with someone who only ever asks for something every time you see them? No. You have to have a mix or people are going to get bored and they might even get turned off completely. So the more you invest in strengthening your brand, the better conversion and retention you can find. That same uh, do's and don'ts article I referenced earlier, um, they also shared that most nonprofits, 93%, believe in branding and that it positively impacts engagement from donors. Please don't skimp on that in your messaging mix. And next, I am going to pass it back to Jamie this time, and she's going to share another thing that you shouldn't skimp on, which is testing. All right. Thank you, Lizzie. I'm hoping you can still hear me. I'm having some uh, technical difficulties and can't take control of the screen. Uh, Lizzie, can you just confirm that you can still advance the slides for me as I share? Yeah, sure. I sure can. Okay, and hopefully my spinning uh, rainbow wheel will uh, stop at some point. Uh, so just want to thank you for uh, that information. Uh, so as we dive into uh, the next mistake, which is uh, skipping, and it looks like I can take control now, so let me give that a try. All right, I'm all caught up. Uh, so uh, mistake number four, skipping the test. Uh, so as we dive into this one, I'll, I'll start with uh, the direct mail side. And uh, direct mail testing can help you determine which elements of your direct mail program are working to acquire, convert, retain donors, and help you optimize future direct mail pieces. And if you're new at this, just, just start with the question of what you want to test for. So I'll give you a few examples of common examples we see there. So asking the question, you know, which piece produces the higher average gift amount or which piece yields the highest overall response rate or which let's say acquisition letter uh, yields the most new donors responses so whatever you're trying to figure out get that question set and then once you have that question pinned down you want to determine which groups will be used for the test so maybe you just split a certain group 50 50 uh, or maybe you want to see if certain things work better specifically with your top donor group for instance 
And uh, regardless of how you want to slice and dice it, and I'm going to give you a few examples of how you can test here in a moment, but uh, we do recommend that you only test one thing at a time, like any good test, right? You, you don't want to add too many variables in, uh, and then you won't know what the reason for the change is uh, if there is a change. So a few things that you can test here. Uh, some of our clients test their outer envelopes, you know, and and really what you're testing here is does it pass that elbow test as as someone's receiving mail and deciding whether it goes in the uh, in the recycling bin or on the counter to consider later. Uh, so uh, I thought I would just use the webinar art here to show you uh, the difference between you know maybe one envelope that's super simple, it's done on the cheap, maybe it's just black and white. Uh, versus one that's a little more of an investment, has some full color, bleed, a nice image on it. Does that make a difference in uh, whatever it is that you're testing? You can also A-B test copy uh, messaging. So we talked about personalization before. So uh, say two different opening sentences, either a dear friend that everybody gets or a dear Sally, dear Lizzie, dear Jamie, and see if that, that makes a difference. You can also try testing a straight black and white letter versus a designed or color letter. And I'm just using these visuals as an example. We didn't actually A-B test these for our friends at Community Foundation, uh, but we did move them from the simple letter you see there on the left uh, to a more engaging letter on the right. And then we were able to track those results uh, year to year to see how that compared. Another thing you can test is call to action. So maybe uh, one points to people to a website and the other one asks them to call, or maybe it's texting to give a certain number. Um, and then sometimes that helps determine your audience in terms of what media type they prefer. So maybe you're not investing in the Mosaic profiles, but you're trying to get a sense of what call to action do they naturally go toward uh, if given the chance. All right, uh, and then we also see more and more testing with QR postcards or QR codes, uh, and where we see this a lot is uh, people who are who have you know historically invested in creating these nice big uh, newsletters, multiple pages, so it's printed, it's sent, and all that expense goes into it. And they've been asking, you know, would a QR code on a postcard? Uh, still do the trick uh, with a lot less printing and postage cost. And so we're in the process with a few of our clients to test that. And the big thing there is to see, you know, did donations still come? Did they actually go and read the newsletter? Did they go to the website? Did they engage with the QR code? And better yet, while they were there, did they click the donate button? Those are all things that metrics would tell you. And that's just on the direct mail side. Uh, in addition to direct mail, you can also test your digital, your social campaigns, creative, uh, see how they compare. And I'll give you an example of that here. Uh, this just happens to be for a, a local credit union client. And, you know, we couldn't decide which dog would get the most attention. Uh, and, and of course, the data didn't lie. It, it was the one on the right. Um, and the way that these A-B tests uh, work for digital and social is the first half of the campaign, you're A-B testing both, and then the second half you reserve for the winner so that more dollars are put toward uh, the creative that you know is performing well. You can also A-B test emails, so a fully designed kind of flat file uh, that you see there on the right versus just text. And sometimes those just text options do surprisingly better, although they're way uglier. Uh, our art department doesn't like that, of course, um, but it's because people don't have to click that download images button to see the whole message. So we do try to actually um, uh, recommend uh, somewhere in between so people can still see the image, but they don't have to rely on the download images button uh, to, to see all of that. All right, so that's mistake number four, skipping the test. On to mistake number five which is not evaluating your digital metrics or not doing so often enough. 
So we've been talking a while. Uh, we wanted to get a, a, a chance uh, for you all to weigh in. So we're going to do a quick poll question that will appear on your screen. And that poll is completely anonymous, so no one's going to know how you answer this. But you'll see it pop up there. And I'm going to rely on my friend Robin to put that up there. So you see there's options here on what's your current comfort level with Google Analytics? Do you use it all the time? Do you look at it sometimes, but you don't always know how to use the data? Uh, do you have it and maybe aren't using the data? Or maybe you're not even sure what Google Analytics is. So take take a few seconds there to uh, um, answer that. I'll do the same here to get this window out of my way. <laughs> All right. So while we wait for everyone to submit their answer to that poll, just a bit of general information here on Google Analytics. Uh, we see a lot of our nonprofit clients uh, have a lot of other things to focus on, right? So you're receiving donations and you're fulfilling premiums and you're sending acknowledgements, you're planning events, you're busy people, and we totally get that. Uh, however, when you're so busy that you're not reviewing things like your website, uh, Google Analytics reporting, you may be missing out on donations you're not getting for certain reasons. And there's often really valuable insight baked into uh, the data that you receive in those reporting reports if you know where and how to look. All right, so Robin, did, did we give enough time or do you need a little more? We got, we've, uh, if you haven't answered the poll, please go ahead and answer it. We've not had everyone answer it, but it okay. looks like we've got a lot of people who don't know what Google Analytics is. Um, second behind, we have it, but no one uses the data. And then I use it all the time, but that's less than 20% of you are using it all the time. So this okay. looks like an area of something that people could learn about. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, that doesn't surprise me. Um, there's, there's a lot of folks who are, are still learning, uh, especially, uh, to really get value out of it, not just to glance at it every once in a while. Um, so the big reason uh, why Google Analytics tracking is important is it may show you um, that there are certain parts of your website that isn't, they're not getting any traction at all. So maybe that informs you that the page's content um, e either isn't valuable to your donor or your potential donor. Maybe the page needs more attention. Maybe it needs a, a few more marketing dollars put toward pointing to it. Um, it may also show you where traffic is bouncing, and that's of particular uh, value because if you can know where that drop-off point is, you can adjust, say, that page's language or imagery you can consider making. I know sometimes there's limitations on what uh, our clients can do within their own website, so we can create a, a customized landing page that just ushers potential donors, maybe it's from an ad or a social post, uh, ushers them into the website in a way that's really customized and continues that journey of um, messaging, imagery that brings them right to that donate uh, section. Sorry, I got my spinning ball again. Bear with me <laughs> as I catch up. Okay. Um, as we think about uh, website traffic, just a note to um, you want to be checking both your organic traffic and your paid traffic. So organic is what comes uh, on traffic that comes on its own, maybe through a search engine or people typing in your URL right into their browser uh, window. And paid traffic is obviously from the uh, paid ads that you put out there on the internet. And a lot of people only focus on the traffic that comes with paid campaigns. Understandably, they want to justify the cost of those, but you don't want to forget to also monitor your organic website traffic. And the reason for that is it can help justify some of the more traditional branding campaigns you might be doing. Uh, it, it also justifies things like uh, events and just awareness uh, uh, activity that's happening around your nonprofit brand. Uh, it could also justify if ever you're doing transit or uh, billboards or TV, anything that people can't click, right? Um, they tend to see those messages and then go to the site organically. So that's what helps um, show that those things are working if that organic number is higher. Uh, so, um, sorry, 
Here we go. Um, so in addition to Google Analytics, uh, another set of digital metrics that you shouldn't be neglecting is your digital display and your social ad or video campaigns reporting. And there's some uh, samples of what that could look like there. And you can see that you uh, should be looking at impressions, click counts, click through rates, and um, other information about engagement there. And then on the video side, it has its own set of metrics. And in addition to impressions and clicks, we're also taking a look at that uh, view completion rate. And I know this is a lot of numbers to have to digest all the time, but so people are saying like, why does that really matter? So for instance, if your digital display ad reporting shows you're not getting a high enough click through rate, or your video reporting like this is showing a lower view completion rate than, you're, than you've been seeing before, it may mean that either your targeting is off or the creative needs to be rethought or refreshed. And people always say like, how often do we need to refresh it? Um, and our rule of thumb there is every three months is a good, a, a good place to aim if you can. Longer than that and even really good creative can get stale and you'll see those engagement numbers start to decrease. And if the click-through rate is there, but the donations aren't. Sometimes we see that scenario. Then we start taking a look at, you know, uh, where potential donors are going to your site because they're interested in potentially learning more about your organization or donating, uh, but then they're dropping off at a certain point. In addition to monitoring your organic and paid website traffic, uh, also your ad campaigns, you wanna be looking at emails, right? Are people opening them? Are, are they clicking on them? And there's not one magic rate to aim at here. Uh, however, you wanna have a mindfulness of what e-blasts were more effective than others as you compare them to each other's and then try to replicate the content, the send date, the send time of the high performing ones. And you also wanna keep an eye on that unsubscribe list. Uh, too many of those unsubscribes also signals that something else is wrong, either in the targeting or the uh, creative. And then of course, don't forget to check your social media post engagement, uh, both for the organic posts and the paid ads, you know, asking which ones uh, received the most engagement. Do the data patterns suggest it's because of the content? Is it because it's this certain time of day or certain day that works best? And if you check these uh, metrics, I can bet you will find that the highest engaging ones are often the ones that took you the most time to make. <laughs> and maybe they involved uh, photos of real people. Uh, I give the example here of um, some trainer spotlights we do for our friends at Team Awareness. I hope Dan, client Dan's on the call. Um, and these always perform very well because it's, it's somebody that people recognize and they comment and they share and they like. So overall, paying attention to your metrics helps uh, helps you make decisions as you look at this important feedback loop. So uh, it starts with making a goal, right? And then you try a new tactic. Say you try uh, Instagram ads or you try a pre-roll video, and then you learn from that experience through the metrics. That's the only way to learn, right? Is taking a look at the, the clicks, the analytics, how did it impact um, those, those metrics? And then that helps you refine your strategy. And then we start all over again, maybe with the new goal of improving in some way. But a note of caution as you refine your strategy and go through that, that circle, be patient, uh, making changes and seeing how that how the data reflects, say a good choice is, it's a long game. You know, it may take several months to see higher donations come your way, but it is worth it, I promise. All right, five mistakes down, folks. Thanks for hanging with us. Uh, we got two to go and we'll go on to mistake number six. Thank you, Jamie. We touched on this mistake uh, previously when we were talking about how we can get comfortable in our traditional marketing techniques and that we risk falling to the back of the pack when it comes to digital. Again, you don't have to be the first and go through all those pains of figuring it out, but you certainly don't wanna be the last. So today we will discuss a few things uh, that are up and coming to help you get into the best position for your overall strategy. Oftentimes we hear information about digital trends talked about in the news, on LinkedIn, or on blogs. We don't always know how they're really gonna to pertain to us. 
What does it mean to me as a nonprofit marketer that they might do away with cookies at some point? Sidebar, cookies are what your browser uses to track your comings and goings online in order to know more about you. Marketers can buy that data and use it to target you based on what demographic you've been identified as or what your interests are based on your online behaviors. They are very valuable, but as you can imagine, they might feel intrusive too. Do I need to care about new social platforms and what's out there that's worthwhile? And there's probably a million questions about AI that go far beyond just even what we do for work, but also all of our lives. So let's talk about each of these separately. The trend towards increasing user privacy has really picked up momentum in the last few years. The days of tracking everything we do online and sharing that out into the marketplace are going to come to an end. Google keeps moving out the end date for getting rid of cookies in their Chrome browser, which has recently been pushed back to sometime early 2025, but we know it's coming and need to prepare. To do that, you'll wanna experiment with audience targeting that uses first party data or campaigns that target contextually, meaning they target to relevant content. So an example of contextual targeting could be running your ad about endowments for your community foundation, and how they create a legacy alongside articles about investments or trust planning. The message and the content they're reading and the message in your ad are complementary, and that makes them more effective. Another alternative to consider in a cookie-less world is to use more app-based targeting solutions where we're able to identify online behaviors and interests based on how pe people use apps on their devices, and then we deliver ads within those apps. But even that landscape is evolving as New York State passed legislation last year to further restrict where we can target ads through geofencing, which is where we target ads based on the location of people's mobile devices. So add, they added in uh, healthcare facilities to the list of places that are off limits in an effort to protect patient privacy. Not only do we need to be able to adapt to these changes impacting how we target audiences in our digital campaigns, but we also need to be sure we're following suit in our own practices. The trend is happening because consumers are demanding it. People want to feel like the businesses and the, and the platforms that they engage with respect their privacy. A big way that organizations can deliver on this is to make sure your lists are clean. Check against the NCOA. Make sure that you honor unsubscribes and stops. If someone requests to receive information from you, you want a great system in place to make sure they get what they've requested. It's just as important that when someone requests to stop receiving information from you, that you ensure their request is honored there too. You don't want wor the word of mouth about your organization to be that people feel harassed or like they just cannot escape from your amazing multimedia presence because you keep emailing them after they've unsubscribed 10 times or you keep sending mailers to the wrong home or even to the home of someone who died. It's in your best interest to clean up your list and take what steps you can to align with the privacy movement. All right, moving on to social platforms. With 100 million monthly users already, Threads is the latest platform for Meta. They're the owners of Facebook and Instagram. It's about dialogue, not just communication. So the goal on this platform is to be very engaging and thought provoking, but in a very positive way because the vibe of threads is meant to be more positive and creative. Let's do another fun poll. Here we go. This should either pop up into your main screen or it may appear in your chat box. But I believe to answer it, it should pop up in your main screen. So if you would go ahead and answer that, that would be great. Now, if the internet is capable of letting us have a positive vibes only kind of place, I think that could be a really nice place for a nonprofit. Uh, at the very least, we encourage you today to secure your username on Threads, which does require you to also have an Instagram account. How are we doing on the survey? Did everyone get the hand? Um, we've got question? about a third of the people are using it and the about half have not even heard of it until now. So there you okay. go. All right. Well, all right. Glad you're here today then. Uh, go ahead and get your username uh, locked in, but don't feel like you have to use it right away. Feel free to sit back, uh, follow some other organizations on there and see um, what they're doing. There's some that are doing it really well, like TED Talks, Teach for America, UNICEF see what they're using the platform for and how it might work for you, your media mix, your message mix, 
what dialogue would you want to have with your followers? Here's some threads from Teach for America where you can see they're very cheeky and fun. That's the culture on their threads channel. And maybe this could work for you. UNICEF does a lot of storytelling and they feature a lot of videos in their threads. So maybe that's your vibe. The goal for threads is not going to be a lot of website traffic. Um, might not always include calls to action. It's a lot more about connecting and having meaningful dialogue. So it'll expand your social presence. It's just yet another touch point for a new generational way of reaching people with content that's light, heartwarming, and fun. And then the last big change that's really going to dominate 2024, it already has, is artificial intelligence or AI. And that's so big, it really needs its own segment. So now I'm going to pass it back to Jamie, and she will give you the scoop on AI mistakes. All right. Thank you, Lizzie. That was great. So, all right, gang, we made it to our last final mistake, number seven, and that is relying too heavily or too lightly on AI tools. And before I dive in, just full transparency, like I'm not an AI expert. I think you should challenge anyone who claims to be an AI expert at this point because it's all new and we're all just doing our best to try and figure it out as it rolls out. Uh, but I do know enough about it to know there are some mistakes to be made on either side of the spectrum, either over relying or under relying. So we're gonna talk first about over relying. And I, I can't miss the opportunity to um, pick on the uh, design uh, world of AI. Uh, so when you over, whoop, did I go one too many? There we go, let's get back there. Um, so we're starting to see some over relying on AI for visual imagery, and that can obviously be a little troublesome. Uh, so I'm just giving some extreme examples here to give, to make the point. Um, so you can see uh, the one on the left there sometimes AI tools are smart enough to make a thing, but they're not smart enough to put it in the right context. So this might be something that AI will give you if you prompt it with the words salmon on the river, right? Uh, so that, that just shows you kind of how the AI brain works. It's not putting it all together. The image on the right looks to be a little better at first glance. You know, say you're you're prompting it, you know, give me an image of a man crying in front of a group. But then you realize that this lady uh, in the back has three legs. Uh, so you got to watch out for mistakes like that if you rely or if you over rely uh, on it for image generation. In addition to some of the obvious visual mistakes, uh, there also may be some other problems uh, when you over rely on AI on the writing side. And the biggest one we're seeing here is that you may lose your brand voice, that unique character behind your specific nonprofit. And, you know, maybe the robots will advance uh, to fully capture that someday, but that day is not today. Uh, so we still have to use AI maybe just for that idea generation and then still have a human give it that brand voice. You also want to watch for plagiarism when using AI tools, and this is a risk no matter what, um, but certainly when you put in prompts like write in the style of this fundraising expert or write in the style of this other nonprofit I see doing the right thing. Um, or design in the style of this New Yorker cartoonist, to give an extreme example. Of course, that's going to be dancing on the line of plagiarism. Uh, what's good, though, is that we're seeing a lot of the AI, AI tools uh, build in some plagiarism protection. Uh, we're seeing that with tools like Grammarly and Turnitin, uh, where they have uh, those tools built right, in, right into um, to the tool as you're using it. Um, Another thing you want to be careful of uh, with over relying on AI is making room for misinformation. So because of the nature of how AI works, it, it brings all the information that's out there on the Internet into these tools. And there's a lot of misinformation out there on the Internet. So you constantly need to be uh, verifying it. And one way to do that is to use a tool, say, like ChatGPT. A lot of people are uh, starting with that one because they're, they're familiar with that one. Uh, but say they get a bunch of information out of ChatGPT. Well, ChatGPT isn't very good at sourcing information. 
So uh, a tip that I've heard is taking, uh, copying and pasting the information you get from ChatGPT and putting it into another tool that is better at sourcing. So one I've heard of is Perplexity AI. And you would give Perplexity AI the, t the prompt, add sources to this sample. And then it would take, take the time to do that. And then you may say, remove any anything in this article that is not sourced, right? So that you have a nice clean copy to then pull into whatever marketing uh, uh, campaign or mailer that you're that you're putting together. Uh, Microsoft's Copilot uh, also just added a sourcing tool. And if you're a Microsoft shop uh, like we are, you know, we use Teams and Outlook and Word. It's nice having that Copilot like baked into programs we're already using. We don't have to learn how to use something else just to get the AI, um, you know, trying out AI within it. And then in addition to misinformation, of course, I, I put bias, prejudice there. That might be there for the same reason as I was saying before, you know, AI tools are bringing things in and the world is biased, unfortunately. So just to give an example in the nonprofit world, say you're asking an AI tool to draw you a philanthropist. Well, it might draw you an old white man. And of course, that's not representative of uh, the donor base that many of our organizations have. However, uh, even with that list of cautions, we don't want to swing so f so far uh, against AI uh, because there might be some mistakes you're making by under relying on it too. So, um, for instance, you may be missing out on some increased efficiency or productivity by by not using at least AI tools in part. There may be opportunities for you to up your game for smarter donor engagement, propensity models uh, with a, uh, without using AI tools. We'll talk about those in a few minutes. And you may be taking more time to do mundane tasks, you know, things like researching things uh, when you could be relying on tools like ChatGPT to take out at least the earlier phases of that research. So before we dive into some actual tool recommendations, uh, I think it's important to understand that all AI tools are in two categories. So they're either generative AI, which uh, is powering tools like ChatGPT. It's the type of AI focused on creation, and it can help you create text, images, and more. And then we also have predictive AI, and that's the type of AI that makes predictions based on historical data and patterns. So very different in the way that they work. So let's look at a, a few on, on each side. So uh, as, you, as you are in your nonprofit, here are a few AI tools uh, for you. So the first one is uh, an AI power tool called CauseWriter AI. And what's neat about them is they help create personas among your donor list. So uh, you may submit your, your donor list and it would pop out uh, per, a persona for say uh, the, the donors that are represented the most in that list. So, you know, uh, just to give you an example of what a persona might look like, like my name is Jamie and you'd get a little picture of me and uh, she's a 39 year old business owner. She enjoys creative writing and dogs. She holds a Christian worldview and she doesn't have any kids, right? That's a persona of a donor like me. And maybe there are others just like me in your uh, donor list. So you could upload that persona's information into a system like ChatGPT or other large language models, and then you can interact with it. So you can start asking questions like, what uh, subject line would Jamie open in her email inbox? Or what would make uh, her open up a annual appeal? Uh, what, what should go on the envelope? And you can interact with it like that. So that's generative AI. And you can see that often the magic of AI is not using one tool, but combining different tools and uh, asking them to kind of work together because as I said, they all have different things that they're really good at. Let's see if I can get my computer keeping up. All right. And then secondly, uh, large language models, uh, I, I mentioned chat GPT, but there are others, Anthropics, Claude, Microsoft's uh, used to be Bing Chat, now it's Copilot. Um, you can use these to research things. So to give an example in the nonprofit world, maybe you're asking it for the best volunteer management system for nonprofits, and maybe it'll list 10 of them. 
But remember, it's not just a search engine. So you don't want to just leave it there. The power is giving it specific prompts that have multiple layers to them. So then you would ask a second question once you get the original 10 uh, volunteer uh, management systems. You might say, hey, take the above, list and rank them by function, add a rating, and compare the list to uh, within the list to, to one another. And then it might think a little bit and, and give you a new answer. And then you might say, okay, of the results you gave me, now rank them in terms of price. And so you can see it's more of a conversation and a dialogue. It's weird because it's a robot, but you are kind of talking to it and asking it to do things. And if it goes a little too far one way, you can ask for it to come back. Uh, and if the list gets too long and complicated, just tell it, explain this to me like I am a five-year-old. <laughs> I love that prompt because it helps uh, simplify things. All right. And uh, another tool, hopefully my slide is advancing here, uh, is what AI can do today. Com. This is a great website to go to, to explore different tools and see what's out there. I, and you can just give it a task. Like I just typed in donor acknowledgement letter and it shows me what AI tools are out there. And then I can go and Google those and see if they can help. So that's a, a great uh, website to check out. And if all of this talk about new technology has you feeling like this, <laughs> Uh, all the mistakes you need to avoid, uh, we totally understand. Uh, just remember, it's okay to try one new thing at a time, even if that new thing is bringing in a team like Rieger to just help you tackle it all. So I just want to say thank you for hanging with us. Thanks for working through the technology glitches. Uh, and we're not going to turn it over to questions, although I know we're pushing 1 p.m. here. Right. Take it over, Robin. And I think, yeah, we are pushing one o'clock. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to aggregate those questions. We got quite a few. We got some good ones. We'll put Great. them by the mistake, get those pushed out to you then. And if Jamie, you could add up one more then, there's your contact information. Oh, sure. Yes. One thank note. You. Um, we want you to watch your email that's going to have a link to the presentation, the webinar recording, and we'll answer those questions that did come in. And thank you for your engagement on those questions. We really do appreciate it. Um, one note, the presentation deck will also contain all of the sources used today, so you can click and find even more information on that. Remember one uh, that the Rieger Marketing Communications team is here to help you. If you have any questions about today's presentation or feel that a consultation with one of our team can help your business, please reach out. There's Jamie's contact information. And on behalf of the entire Rieger Marketing Communications team and Advanced Media New York, we want to thank you so much for taking the time to learn what not to do so you're better equipped to maximize the ROI of your fundraising and marketing efforts. Thank you again and have a really great day. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.